So, um, I work in Henderson County. This is a picture of, uh, ju from Jump Off Rock there in Laurel Park, if you've ever been there. Just three miles outside of town, you go straight up the mountain, uh, the back side of downtown, and you can find this beautiful uh, overlook um, uh, where you can see um, the Etowah uh, Valley, uh, where the town of Etowah is between um, Hendersonville and Brevard. And, the purpose of the picture is just to demonstrate, you know, the tree canopy as it uh, is today. Um, it's a little deceiving because if you were to get a little altitude, you'd see a lot fewer trees and a lot more open spaces. When you look at it at an angle, it looks pretty dense, densely forested, which it actually isn't. Uh, off in the distance, of course, is the Pisgah National Forest. And um, thank God we have national forest and other protected green spaces because if we didn't, uh, we'd be in some real trouble. Uh, so I have a lot of material to cover and not enough time, so I'm going to go, I'm going to kind of try to plow through as much of it as I can. Um, hopefully uh, we'll get through it. So we're not the first ones to inhabit the area, correct? Uh, we're, not, we're also not the first ones to exploit the environment. So uh, pre-Columbian, pre-Christopher um, Columbus, uh, uh, bumbling into the New World, um, there were millions and millions and millions of Native Americans on the, um, in the Americas. Uh, some estimates as high as 100 million, maybe even higher. Uh, in fact, when he, when he tried to approach the um, East Coast, uh, he had an initial, an initial good interaction. Uh, the Indians, the Native Americans came out in boats to check them out and see who they were. Somebody uh, supposedly might have stolen something off his boat, then they got aggressive, people got hurt. So um, he had to leave real quick because he was about to get overwhelmed. And uh, he couldn't make it, the word would spread down the coast as he was going that, hey, this guy's no good, don't let him land. And he couldn't land until he got all the way down to Hispaniola. There were so many people occupying the coast of the eastern United States that once he made a few of them mad, he couldn't land anymore. And he had to go all the way down to the Caribbean to finally find a place to land. And of course, you know what happened after that. So, um, you know, Native Americans, this is a picture um, of what Cahokia, uh, it's now a series of, of earthen mounds in Illinois, what it might have looked like when it was a thriving city, uh, estimated to be maybe 20,000 people, as big as London was at the time. Um, and this is a year 1000 through 1350. Um, they were having a real um, uh, boom in their culture. And uh, uh, if you, wanted to try to feed 20,000 people on the low yields of corn that they got at the time. You know, we get like 180 bushels an acre now. They used to get about 30. So you would need many, 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 many thousands of acres, uh, one square mile per 180 people of corn just to feed them. So just a settlement like this, just one city, Native American city, had a huge impact, no different than we do today, except not nearly on the scale that we do, of course, because uh, they, they were using basically hand power and, and la uh, labor. They hadn't harnessed any uh, combustibles like we have. Um, after um, smallpox initially brought here by Columbus and then the, the subsequent conquistadors uh, got spread around, over 90% of the population was wiped out, right? So you gotta think this is in the 14 and early 1500s. By the time the pilgrims landed in the 1600s, the woods had returned to a natural state it looked to them like an untouched, pristine environment, but you can read accounts of them uh, crunching over bones in old Indian villages uh, as they were first settling, setting up Plymouth and their little settlement there. So um, it's big picture wise, you gotta think, you know, we're not the first ones here, we're not the first ones to do what we're doing, and the, the great news is that no matter what we do, the earth will abide, right? Have you ever read that book, Earth, earth Abides? It's a really, really great book if you've never read it. And it's all about how, uh, how quickly um, Mother Nature will just shake us off like a case of fleas if, uh, <laughs> if given the, uh, the, the chance. So, you know, the forest grew back, the colonists settled the land, um, went back to a very exploitative kind of use of the land. Basically, uh, have you ever read um, the biography of Meriwether Lewis. So Meriwether Lewis's family were tobacco farmers and they started in Virginia and they ended up in Georgia because they would farm for a few years and then move, farm for a few years and move. 
basically just uh, using up the land. They would come into a big forest, girdle all the trees with an axes and kill them. They wouldn't cut them down, just leave them standing, start planting underneath, use up all the nutrients that Mother Nature had built up in the soil. And when that was gone, they'd move on somewhere else. And so, you know, then um, people like um, uh, your, your peasant class, I don't know what you would call them, just the normal people, would you know, kind of take over these lands that were kind of been run down. They'd farm them and run them down even worse. And by the time the late 1800s were here, the southeast you know, looked like a nuclear bomb had fallen in many places. Uh, it was highly eroded. I would notice driving up here on, um, on 9, you all have got a really great kudzu problem here. It's, uh, <laughs> Um, we have an English ivy problem where I come from up in uh, Hendersonville, but, um, but y'all have a tremendous kudzu problem. Uh, and that was brought in to solve this. And it did a great job. In fact, I was driving on that road thinking, man, look how much kudzu this is. This is terrible. But if it weren't there, two years ago, these last two years of rain, a lot of those mountainsides would be down in the river right now. So, you know, we got we to gotta solve it. There's two problems, right? We got the erosion problem, but we also got the, the kudzu problem. So uh, you, can even, you can see in this picture, this is many years after uh, the, the farmer had given up on the place. Trees are already starting to um, uh, recolonize the area in what we call succession. You know, forests go through succession. If you basically burn one down and nature would burn it down or blast it with a, um, uh, a volcano or we would come in and bulldoze it. If you, didn't, did, no, if you did nothing to it, then um, seeds that flew would come and land seeds that have built up in the soil and the seed bank would start to sprout. Um, then, you know, so you'd have all these weeds, then you'd get some trees, some fast growing trees like sweet gums and maples and pines, and then eventually your broad, big broadleaf like your oaks and things would move in. So that's how succession works, you know. We can destroy a piece of property uh, and turn our backs on it and in 100 years you'd never know we had been there because Mother Nature uh, heals it. We don't want to do it. This is Cloudland Canyon. Uh, I'm from Georgia originally. And this is in southwest Georgia. That's an erosion rill that's as big as a canyon. It's probably 600 feet deep. Um, and we've turned it into a state park in Georgia. Uh, we, uh, we don't have a lot to do down there, so we, uh, we like looking at, like, at, at, er at erosion. And, uh, but it's beautiful. Um, in fact, this is, all, you know, this is all ancient ocean bed here and it's full of fossils and all kinds of neat stuff, but um, originally there was like one farmhouse up here. Uh, it's long since got swallowed up by that gully, and it's a huge, many acres uh, of land down there that's taken up by it. Um, this is a place I used to go deer hunting, and um, this was a 30-foot deep erosion reel that you can see Mother Nature has reclaimed and stabilized over time. Um, this one here is about 20 feet deep, but only about 10 feet wide. It's super steep. Um, so if you live in highly erodible places um, and you take off all of the vegetation, vegetative cover, then this is what happens, right? So this has happened multiple times uh, throughout our history in the southeast. Um, if you've ever been to the Cradle of Forestry and seen the pictures of what the land looked like when Commodore Biltmore bought it, again, it looked like a nuclear bomb had fallen on the place. There wasn't a, a, a twig left because the... Um, loggers had come in and taken it all away. Kudzu uh, was brought in to control that erosion. I uh, did a very good job. <laughs> Too good of a job. And um, it particularly likes mountains because it needs, it needs to be able to climb to do, its, to do its business, right? Vines like to climb. If you plant, it's, it doesn't do very well in a flat area, but if you put some steepness, some, um, some topography around it, it really goes crazy. Uh, so this is where I used to work in Gwinnett County, Georgia, which is, should be a cautionary tale to you all, okay? So Gwinnett County was once like Polk County, very rural. It was the horse county for, is where if you wanted to have a horse farm uh, and you lived in Atlanta, you would go out to Gwinnett or Cobb County or uh, Forsyth County, one of these surrounding counties that surround the Atlanta metro. And Gwinnett was the last one. It was kind of the last one to go. It was still rural when I, in the early 2000s. Um, but literally, uh, and they had very lax zoning rules. You know, the, the, the wolves were in charge of the hen house in that county. And basically, the entire place went, turned into a subdivision. I mean, literally. It went from 500,000 to a million people in just a few years. And, um, you know, this is 
a cautionary tale for today about what could happen here. Uh, I'm in Henderson County, like I said, and it just in the three years I've been there, I can already see some of the telltale signs of this rapid uh, uh, development. Um, one of the big problems we had in this county was stormwater, right? So once you pave, once you pave everything or even compact all this soil, you know, the water runs straight away. It doesn't have time to percolate into the soil, runs straight away off into the creeks and streams, erodes the stream banks, the trees fall in the streams, and, the, and it just becomes this big, big, big mess, ecological disaster, really. Um, people uh, come in and, you know, they want to, they love this, they, they, they love this oak tree, right? It's probably a 200 year old, oak, old white oak. Uh, this, uh, this lovely lady, I went to look at this tree because it was starting to die, and she wanted to know why I was dying. I was like, well, I think it might be because you built your house under it, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, building houses under it, dis disturbing roots, we'll talk a lot about all this stuff later. Planting tree, uh, building up uh, berms and planting trees and shrubs around the base of trees. If you go into the woods, you don't see this, right? You don't see that happening. That's not good for trees. That's a sure way to kill one. Um, another thing she was doing is you can see these water soaked areas. She was irrigating all of this with overhead irrigation. So every day the, the, the irrigation would spray the tree and it was getting wet and not, never drying and it started getting all sorts of fungal rots. So that's jump off rock and we were looking earlier in that picture out this direction. So you can see there's a lot more open area than that uh, even that picture uh, showed but you know this is all agricultural land which is you know it's a good use of it um, typically as long as it's done well and not um, overdone or uh, miss, the land's not misused and we got to eat right so that's you know this is all tomato farms down here and vegetables and corn and all of that. Um, I kayaked the uh, French Broad River last summer and there was all this stuff hanging from the trees and I couldn't figure out what it was and after a while I saw this ear of corn. So it was literally millions and millions and millions of corn stalks in the river that were like hanging off the trees for miles and miles and miles all down through that valley where it all got washed up. Um, but the thing is, so this is where we are today, snapshot. This is where we are today, probably even a few years ago because it's Google Earth, it's, you know, they don't keep it up to day to day. Uh, this is probably, there's probably even less canopy cover. You know, if you looked at this, what would you say that's 50% trees, maybe? Probably 50%, just a rough estimate. Maybe a little more than 50. Uh, this is Hendersonville, right here, that's downtown, the courthouse. And you can see uh, the roads that radiate out, there's I-26. But you can see where the development goes, uh, that's, uh, what is that, that's the, uh, uh, the, Edney, the 64 corridor there. Um, and this is the Spartanburg Highway corridor down through here. And this is how sprawl happens, right? You know, um, you know people buy this land out here because it's cheap, and then they hang on to it, and then eventually they put a CVS on that corner. And then they put a CVS on the inside, then they sell the corner to three other stores. And that's how it goes, right? It just keeps moving further and further out. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is, again, a snapshot. But eventually, you know, it's going to be more like this. All of this, there's not, a tr there's not enough trees in this area to see them, right? So it's basically totally impervious areas. All of that water hits the ground and runs straight off into the rivers. Now, if you look out here, this is our apple growing region. That's Dana out there. These are all apple orchards out here. Um, so, agriculture, uh, where is that, it's a little more zoomed in, oh okay so here we are right, so there's Hendersonville and there's us today somewhere in that area, it was getting hard to see once you zoom out it doesn't, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, nature center disappears off the map, but uh, it's somewhere in that area and uh, if you look down here you can see the effects of what town? Is it Greenville down that way, right? Um, and then this is all, uh, a lot of this is pasture land. And all. You see what that, that spot right there looks like a nuclear bomb fell? Yeah. That's the horse park. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it looks like a giant red mud hole right there. Uh, but look, the only place that there's any trees of any consequence are in these protected lands, right? Um, the Green River Game Lands, the, uh, the uh, DuPont State Forest. These are super important to us um, uh, to protect, to make some islands of nature, right? Because human encroachment and human development eventually um, uh, creeps in 
And I, I deal with this every day. Like people come in, they move here from Florida or New York or wherever. And uh, I had a lady come in one day and she was bragging to me about how she'd cut down all the rhododendron in her, in her forest. So, she said, yeah, I got rid of all that ugly rhododendron. I couldn't even see out my window. And um, there was probably snakes and everything out there. And I was like, and so I, I talk, I talk to a lot of people. Every day I'm, I'm telling people, uh, people ask me what plants to plant, what trees to plant. I try to encourage them to plant native plants. You know, we moved to this area because it's a very unique ecosystem. Um, it's terrible that we build our house and we tear, tear it all away, right, and, and, and put grass uh, and a red maple in the front yard. Red maple's a native tree, but not all trees are alike, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So the whole point of this little, this little um, uh, rant that I went through just now is just to get you all thinking. Um, I do this everywhere I go that I do this tree talk. I talk about what the future holds, and there ain't going to be more trees 10 years from now, right? It's just not going to happen unless we really, really, really work at it. There's going to be a lot less trees 10 years from now, and in 20 years from now, even less. If you look, uh, there are estimates between to 2050. Um, so there's, I forget what website it was, but if you look down on the southeast at night from space, you can see Atlanta. It's a big glowing blob in the blackness. And then you can see I-85, and then you see Greenville, Spartanburg, all that. And you can kind of follow the interstates, right? So they, they took and projected it forward 2050 what it might look like. And it was basically one lit up blob from Atlanta all the way over to uh, Raleigh. And, um, so, and they call that the, um, uh, the, uh, the Atlanta Raleigh Metroplex. It's a terrible name, right? It's, it makes me think of the Terminator or something. Um, but basically, that's what's going to happen if you know, things don't change. And I'm not anti-people, I love people, um, but I am pro-tree and pro-environment, so. Uh, this is just a quick map of the county population density just in 2014. I think we may have now, in Hendersonville, moved up to this uh, urban county status, uh, in Buncombe especially. Um, but you can see where the corridors of populations are. And there's still a, real, a lot of rural um, areas in the state. In fact, populations are going down in these places and going up in these places, right? There's no opportunities over here anymore. I was talking to a lady this morning about my hometown in Georgia. There were six cotton mills in that town when I was a kid. Now there's none, and everybody's on uh, government assistance. So uh, that's what's happening in the rural parts of the country right now. All of the wealth is being sucked into the metropolitan areas. Um, that's where all the jobs are. People are moving there. People are take, packing up like, I'm out of here. I, I, can't, I can't live here anymore. Uh, that's r ruining the education system in these areas because there's nobody there to support it, and it just it's a spiraling downhill thing. Uh, that's got nothing to do with trees, but um, so this is uh, if a map uh, from the World Resources Institute: hot spots of suburban encroachment in southern forests. Atlanta's a big one right there, um, but if you look real closely right there, you can see Asheville and uh, Hendersonville. They show up on the map. If you zoom in, it's right there. So um, you know. Again, I-85 right there, I-26 right there. So it kind of follows the interstates, right? Um, this is a map of tree cover loss since 2000 to 2012. So the light purple colors are places where tree canopies have declined. The dark bluer is where tree canopies have actually increased. And that's usually probably because of invasive plants that have taken over ecosystems more than actual people planting trees. So, all of that to say that we're kind of, we're on the precipice of, you know, what could be uh, a problem, what will be a problem in the future if we don't do something now. So, basically, we let's try to get everybody to plant as many trees as possible. And even more important, preserve as many trees as possible. You know, if you're going to build a house, try to save all the trees. There's tree save plans. You can save trees if you're careful about it and you work, work, work diligently around it. So why are trees important? They provide all kinds of services. And, um, you know, in the past, trees have only been valuable after they've been cut down, right? The only time they've had monetary value. And that's one of the problems. So people today are working to try to, you know, quantify the value of a tree so that, and, and figure out a way to incentivize people to keep trees and want to plant trees, right? Um, so they cool through shading, right? Everybody wants to park under the shade tree, right? No matter where you go. Um, holds water. 
I was uh, hiking up at the Piscum Forest, uh, went up to uh, uh, John's Rock, was hiking down, it started to rain, of course, it always rains in the afternoons. And uh, it took about 30 minutes for the rain to finally penetrate the canopy of that forest and hit the ground. You could hear it, it was just raining like crazy. But the canopy actually contained all that water and it slowly started running down the trees and then slowly dripping. Because when the rain's falling from the sky, it's moving really fast, right? Um, if it hits the soil moving that fast, boom, it blows up soil and moves soil, right? So the tree actually slows the water down. And water's erosive power is, is um, totally um, connected to its speed. So the faster it's moving, the more it erode, erodes. So the more you can slow it down, I went and looked at a lady's erosion problem in her yard and I inv advised her to just make some berms, as many as you can, make them across the, the slope just to slow the water down. Every time the water stops, it drops its load of uh, sediment. So you're actually conserving your soil that way. Uh, collects airborne par particulates, uh, trees are a carbon sink, uh, that's a whole other discussion, but uh, trees take carbon out of the air and store it. Um, it provides mental health benefits, and if you don't believe me, go take a walk, right? You, you know, if you're having a bad day and you go walk in a forest, I promise you, you will feel better at the end of that. And I don't need a psychiatrist to tell me how that works. I just know, I know it does. Um, trees uh, protect smaller native plants providing habitat. Huge, huge service. Uh, to the ecosystem. Big mature trees like this um, are uh, sometimes called mother trees. They kind of, they're the basis of a whole network of all kinds of stuff that I'll talk about later is uh, underground and above ground. But they protect all these little delicate native uh, spring ephemeral flowering plants that's like on these posters over here and all of that. So they serve, a, they serve a great purpose. If that tree falls, you get a big sunny patch in the forest, all kinds of weeds grow up, and that usually displaces those uh, delicate natives that, uh, that, such as trilliums and things like that that might have been growing there in the shade of that tree. And you know, it's estimated that a tree uh, provides over $161,000 in environmental services in its lifetime. So that's one tree. Right? And you know, the DuPont forest has probably hundreds of millions of trees. So the value is huge, way more than the lumber value, right? Um, forests capture water, we, we've talked about that, but it, it never hurts to repeat it. The more trees you cut down, the more impervious surfaces you make, the more runoff you get, and the more water that runs straight to the creeks right after a rain. The creeks rise really fast, the water moves really fast, it erodes the banks, the banks collapse, the trees fall in the rivers, and it's a vicious cycle. And you ruin, ruin the rivers. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we're working um, with uh, some uh, hellbender researchers. There's this big salamander that lives in really nice, healthy mountain streams, but it needs really rocky uh, water. And the only places it can live in our area is the Davidson River and um, uh, the Upper French Broad and the Mills River and the North and South Fork of the Mills River. Uh, so that's all mountain streams, right? They can't live in the French Broad because the French Broad's too mucky. It's good. It has no rocks in the bottom of it anymore. It's silted in. Um, when I, w I, I wanted to show this. This is a picture of a place in town. This is Laurel Park. This is the Ingalls. Um, you guys, it doesn't mean much to you, but replace it with any other Ingalls in the world, in the <laughs> southeast, right? So you've got about 100 acres here of impervious surface, all that water runs down the gutters, it floods this street when it's raining really bad. You got all these subdivisions, uh, all that's doing the same thing. And there's this little tiny creek right here that's ankle deep when it's not raining. And if you fall in it when it's raining, you'll drown. I mean, that's, so much water gets into it so fast it becomes a raging torrent. So that's why tree canopy is so important. Um, we work with a lot of people doing stream bank restorations. These people are actually planting, only thing that'll hold a bank together are trees. You can do this, but that's not going to work um, in the long run. Uh, now, if you allow this to grow up in weeds and let the, the weeds kind of grow amongst the rocks, that'll help stabilize. But what, this is unhealthy, an unhealthy stream. You see those, those banks are falling in the river, in the creek. Uh, this is a place, this is actually coming here on uh, Chimney Rock Road from Hendersonville. A lady owns an old campground, and uh, she's got a terrible erosion problem there. All these rocks have like eroded out of there. Uh, the side of the hill and into the creek. But this is how you fix it. Basically, you stabilize the ground. What they do is they put a slope back in there, a, a lower slope, instead of it being like this, they'll, they'll take a grading machine and, and lower it so it's not so steep. 
And then they cover it with uh, materials, that's uh, just decomposable uh, uh, matting. And then they take live stakes in the dormant season of willows and iteas and winter berries and all other kinds of little aquatic trees and they jam them in the ground and they root. So, you know, the next season you come along, it looks like this. You've got all these trees growing and that stabilizes the bank. So plants are super important for creeks and streams. So um, intact trees have value. I'm not going to go into all that because we don't have much time. And not all trees are equal. So if you look really closely, this is in the fall, you'll see these little red dots here. All these little red dots are uh, uh, acerubrum red maples, right? And you think, oh, well, that's great. They all put trees in their yard. Well, the thing is, these are cultivars of acerubrum red maple, and they all have limbs that do this. They don't do that. So they never, they never really cast any shade. So October glory, autumn blaze, all of these uh, cultivars of red maple were designed, selected for this. So they make good street trees. So when you plant them in your front yard, you're basically not doing anything as far as the environment, really. Um, as far as casting shade in the future, these trees will just never do that. And also one of the things is, like a Bradford pear, when they're doing this, they get broken in ice storms, right? All those, that's real um, weak, and I'm going to talk more about that later. So not all trees are equal. We want people to plant trees and plant as many as they can, plant natives. But let's make sure we're planting ones that actually in the future are going to do something for us and not be um, uh, basically useless to us. And this is Gwinnett County when I left. This is what was happening. And this is what's going to happen here if we don't do something. Oh, and, and look, Acer, October Glory Red Maples, every front yard. So none of these are ever going to cast much shade. Um, um, plants do all kinds of great things for us as far as uh, the environment. And you can do landscapes well. There's a way to do it. There's a way to make it ecologically useful as well as beautiful. Um, I have innumerable examples of that. So urban trees, they have a lot going against them from the get-go. So eventually, you know, there's going to be a tree right there planted. And look at that soil. It's all torn up. No topsoil left. It's super compacted from the machinery. Uh, they got piles of junk probably leaching, you know. Uh, it's probably things like concrete going to leach um, calcium, uh, make it the, the ground too uh, uh, alkaline, that sort of thing. So urban trees have a lot going against them just from the beginning, right? It keeps me in business because the urban trees are always dying. Your average urban tree, after either it can be a mature one that you move in next door to, you build a house next to, or it can be one you plant. The average lifespan is 30 years. So 30 years after you move there, whether it's a new plant or a big old one, it lasts about 30 years. I see so many people that have been in their home about 20, 25 years and all their landscape plants are starting to fall apart on them. Uh, youthful trees can withstand damage. This is a major university. It's got a bulldog as a mascot. I won't embarrass me by saying who it is because I attended this place. And this is actually right in front of the forestry school. So uh, they went through there and built it. Now they did a really good thing. There used to be a street that ran through here and they turned it into a park, which is awesome. But they damaged some trees. So they built this rock wall, wall, they cut away about half of that root system, but that tree is still there. Even today, uh, 20 years later, it's still there, living and thriving, because it was young. Just like us, when we're young, we can get the flu, still get up and go to work tomorrow, the next day, right? If I got the flu, I was in bed three days this week, this past winter, with the flu. Never, that's never happened to me before. That just goes to show you that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this tree, also on, a, on the campus of a major university in the southeast that has a bulldog as a mascot, <laughs> did not survive the construction. And as you see, they did not protect the root zone very well. That's a fence, but it's barely even, it's not even out to the drip line of the tree. They didn't protect the roots. That tree died the next summer. I'm not going to read all of this. Uh, Dr. Ed Gilman down in Florida has the most incredible tree website you've ever seen. Dr. Ed Gilman is a, um, a, a, a scientist, a, a tree researcher, and he lived through all those hurricanes in the 2000s, and he you know, drove around and got to thinking, now why did that tree fall and that one didn't? They're right beside each other. They're the same species, same height, same size. Why did this one fall and that one didn't? Real quick, uh, trees in confined soil spaces, like planted between a sidewalk and a house, are more likely to fall over. Trees with root defects, trees with structural roots that have decayed, like, such as this one, uh, trees that are large and old, trees that are recently planted, trees with multiple stems, three stems instead of one, that's much weaker. 
um, they're more likely to blow over. Trees with bark inclusions, which is, I'll show you in a minute, is bark that gets squished between two trunks. They're more likely to break. Uh, trees that have had humongous pruning cuts made to them and decay is built in, grown in. Trees that are all by themselves rather than being in a forest. Trees that are hollow. Trees that have failed before will fail again. Remember that. Uh, if a tree has dropped a limb that big in the past, it will drop a limb that big again. So uh, watch out. And any tree that's had construction damage near it. So basically, uh, uh, well-established, young to medium-aged trees that have been well-maintained are less likely to blow over. Okay, so, you know, this is me standing there. Uh, I'm six feet, so that shows you how big that uh, white oak was. This park system called me to make sure they didn't kill this tree after they had built this. <laughs> uh, I don't know why they didn't call me before because I would have said, why don't you just route this thing about that far away and you'd be doing a great, you'll be saving that tree. But trees, they're made up, trees are a system, right? Just like you're a system, right? Think about all your parts. What keeps you standing? You, know, you got your skeletal system. What keeps you alive? You got your, your uh, vascular system. You got your respiratory system. You got your, the part I like the best, the eating part, the <laughs> digestive system. Um, trees are the same way. They're a system, right? They're, they're built in such a way that they can stand uh, on their own. That tree right there, what do you think the aerial portion of that tree might weigh? Somebody just take a guess. 4,000 pounds. 4,000 pounds? Probably more like 30 tons. <laughs> There's probably like 30 tons of wood in a tree like that. And that's not counting the roots under the ground. And there's just as much wood underground as there is above ground. So when that thing falls on your house, it's going to chop it right in half, right? Even if it falls this slowly, it just squishes your house to the ground. So the system is made up of, of you know, subsystems, essentially. Uh, the most important parts of trees are the roots, of course, because that's what keeps the tree standing. Um, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but this part right here is one of the most important parts of a tree for you to protect, because this is where 90% of your problems come from. Um, under the bark, uh, trees have the uh, layer of tissue that puts on wood, makes wood on the inside and bark on the outside. That's how trees get bigger and bigger around. That's what make, differentiates a tree from a grass. Grasses don't get bigger around. Trees just keep getting, sort of like me, as time goes by, <laughs> they get bigger around, right? Um, <coughs> trees do not keep growing tall, though. They have a predetermined height. So they're only going to get so tall, but they will continue to get fatter, kind of like me. Um, and then you have the canopy of the tree, which is made up of all the branches and leaves and that sort of thing. Uh, tree rings are um, put down annually as the tree grows in, in girth. Every year it makes a ring, right? Uh, those rings are skinnier and fatter according to the weather. If the weather's really good, you'll have a large amount of wood put on in a year, so you'll have a fatter tree ring. If it's a really bad year or drought, the, you'll, you'll hardly be able to distinguish two rings apart because it won't grow much, okay? Um, interestingly, uh, this tree dates back to 1892, and then it was cut down in 2014. It's a hemlock that died from woolly adelgia. Um, this super cool to me. So, as a, I told you, a tree keeps getting fatter, right? So if you were to carve into that tree and carve down to a ring and follow that ring out on all the branches, you could expose what the, that tree looked like in those early years. So this artist, uh, he's an Italian artist, Giuseppe Pannoni. He takes these old logs and he carves into them and he gets down to a single grain and he follows it and he follows it out to the branches. And he, so it just goes to show you that um, you know, these branches uh, start out small but they keep getting, they add girth, right? But deep down inside there is that original little branch. Super, uh, super neat idea. Look at this. So there's the, what it looks like, but this is how big it was when it was cut down. See? It just gives you an idea of how trees grow. They just keep putting on girth. Um, this is a great slide, a great picture a friend of mine sent me because he and I were both uh, tree geeks and we talk a lot about this stuff. And, it's hard to visualize this, visualize this unless you see it. So a limb coming out of a tree is not the same wood as the wood in the trunk, right? 
Do you hear what I'm saying? This wood is different than this wood. And you can see it here. This is the trunk. This was a piece of cedar that was split. The bark is that way. This is the inside of the tree. And this limb is just growing through the bark, growing through the wood, and the wood's growing around it. This is getting bigger and bigger, right? That started out as a single bud inside the tree a long time ago, and it created a new... It's almost like a separate plant. And that's important to understand about tree health and the way trees grow because... Um, that limb does not give a flip about the rest of the tree because that limb is its own organism. It's inserted into the tree. It's part of the tree, but as far as it's concerned, it's all it wants to do is get as much light as possible to do as much work as possible. So if it, grow, if it has to grow out this way so far that the weight of it pulls the tree over, the tree, the, 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 the tree has very little control over that, 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 that limb. There, I'm going to talk a little bit about how trees do control them, but it's interesting to me, right, how every limb is a separate piece of wood. No different than if you built a hat rack and you drilled holes in it and stuck dowels in it. That's the way limbs are in the trunk. That's why if you cut this limb off and you, you maybe you leave a stub sticking out and so the tree can't seal around it and close the hole, wood, uh, wood rotting organisms will rot a hole into the tree. They'll follow that limb into the inside of the tree. That's why it's so important to make proper pruning cuts because if you don't do it right, you'll, you'll make it to where um, it stays open too long and organisms get in there and rot the inside of the tree up. So uh, this is at the University of Georgia um, back in the day when I was there and they wanted me to look at this tree and uh, they wanted to know, they needed a third party to tell them to take it down because it's historic and I mean, it's, it was going to take itself down within days if somebody didn't do it. Uh, but you can see, right, uh, it, a tree that leans more than five degrees um, is un, could be unsafe, right? You stay, if you ever don't believe me, try to stand and lean more than five degrees over, <laughs> right? It gets really hard to hold yourself up. Now imagine if you were suspending 20 tons of wood above you, all of that stress. So you could see what's happening to this tree. It started bowing. No different than if I was breaking a stick across my knee, what would happen before it finally snapped? That's what was going on. Another thing is, you see the soil rising up on this side? It went under the ground on this side. So the roots ball is pulling up out of the ground. You can see that there. Uh, that's a telltale sign. And you know, trees don't, they, sometimes they catastrophically blow over, but sometimes they slowly fall over a period of years. But you can see this coming. Uh, you know, that's, ha that's gonna happen. Just a matter of time. And you just what you want to make sure is nobody's standing under it when it does. Now what also happens when you stress the tree, like just like if you were breaking it across your knee, the wood starts to delaminate. So wood is in fibers, right? So it'll start pulling apart and shredding. Um, that's, it, does, it does it on a large scale on a tree, start getting cracks, stress fractures in the wood. And um, you know, if you see that, a crack in a tree is bad news. So it fits next to your house and it's got cracks in it, you need to be worried. When they cut it down, this is what the inside looked like. Um, that's classic uh, delamination. What would happen eventually is it would have probably broken and part of the trunk would have stayed up. It would have been like this. You've seen that before, right? Um, the interesting thing is that a whole inside was hollow and squirrels had been piling leaves up in there, right? And I'm going to show you a picture that will blow your mind in a minute, but... Um, so this, all these leaves and stuff that squirrels put on the inside rots and makes topsoil. The tree will put roots out and consume that. I've got a good picture of that somewhere. So this is a tree I used to hike around all the time and I used to go, when I'd walk past it, I'd walk around it that way because I was afraid it might fall on me. And uh, so my wife and I would watch it and, that, and it didn't take long, a few years, and it finally toppled. But you can see the crack just got wider and wider every year and it went all the way through the tree it was just a matter of time. It hinged on one side and fell over. Um, but you can see all of this is rotted here. There's no structural roots left, really. So trees don't heal, they seal. You know, we heal. If you cut me, I will grow new tissue in the wound. Uh, if I were a tree, what would happen is my skin would grow over the wound. I would retain the wound and I'd keep on going. That's what trees do. They don't create new tissue. They just cover over the wound. Um, so this is a picture of a pruning, proper pruning cut. Um, this is called the branch collar here. 
is the swollen area around where the branch you remember I told you the branch is inserted into the wood like this so this is swollen here for two reasons one um, it swells in reaction wood uh, reacts to stresses so as this gets bigger it stresses this wood and the tree puts on more wood right there no different than if you uh, if you were to hang uh, a, 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 something off of a tree where I come from an engine block off a tree um, <laughs> and left it out there for years, the wood, the tree would put on all this extra wood up here to hold it up. Trees react to the stress. That's, that's why when you're growing trees as an, in a nursery, you want them to move like this because that's what makes the trunk get bigger and bigger. You want them to flex. If you, if you stake a very young tree and you don't um, allow it some movement, then it'll be very weak and it'll, it'll bend over like that. that. Um, when, they make, when you make the cut, you want to make it outside of the root, the branch collar, because this is the healing potential, the sealing potential right here. This wood will grow very rapidly. There's one that's been done before. And you can see it looks like a little pucker. It's, it's sealed it up. But if you come in here and do what we call as a flush cut, uh, where if I came here and I cut all the way back to there, my wound went from being this big to this big, and I cut away all of the reaction wood that could seal it up. You understand what I'm saying? So do, always leave this little nub that's at the base of this branch. Okay? Epicormic growth is um, trees, as they grow, they lay down buds inside the wood. Just, they're like emergency buds. So that if something comes along and breaks the tree, then it's got all these buds that can shoot out very quickly and put it, make leaves and start making food. It's sort of like an emergency system for the tree. Um, when you prune, you basically make the tree think, uh-oh, something's happened, I need to make some more limbs. And so it, it fires off these buds, that are, they're called latent buds because they just lay there until needed. Um, and they're all in the trunk and all up and down the branches. And uh, this is called epicormic growth. But in this case, they left a little bit of a stub. It didn't seal up quickly. The epicormic growth's growing around there. And this becomes very weak. These limbs, if you walked up to it and pulled on it, they would break right off of that tree. It's very weak. And in the future, will cause um, problems. So all goes back to poor pruning practices, okay? Um, uh, this regulated by oxen is really interesting that so this branch, as it's growing out, it's producing a, growing, a growth hormone. And that growth hormone keeps these buds from growing. So as long as that branch is there, it's producing auxin, which stops these buds from growing. But as soon as the auxin goes away, poof, branches start popping out of the trunk. It's super interesting the way trees are designed. There's a picture with the roots uh, growing in a bark inclusion. So when there, there, it's hard to see for you guys probably, but this is where a big limb fell off of a red maple. Remember when I told you branches that grow like this are very weak? The, the strongest branch is about, it's not totally straight out, but it may be about from 45 degrees to 90 degrees. That's about the strongest branch juncture in a tree. And these very upright selections that we've made in the horticulture industry are good for street trees and that sort of thing. They're not good landscape trees. They get broken very easily, especially in maturity. And what happens is these narrow crotch angles, the narrow angle between the, the branch and the trunk, uh, bark is included in there. So bark, the tree never joins, even though it gets bigger around. There's no connection between this and that. And then the bark is in there, and then it rots, and then you get roots growing in there. And, this becomes a, a very easy place for the wood to break. Uh, buttress roots. So buttress roots are um, architectural, right? Trees are a system. They're a wood system, and that wood system, um, uh, its goal is to remain standing, right? It's got to stand. It's got to make food uh, to, to be able to make progeny, make acorns and seeds. So buttress roots are these, no different than the flying buttresses on medieval uh, churches, cathedrals. They flare out, and this is what holds that tree up, okay? And now, what, what would happen if I buried this tree up to here? What, what, would, what would you not see? You would not see the buttress roots or the root flare. We call it the root flare. If you don't see a root flare on a tree, 
It's buried too deep. And it's bad. Bad, bad, bad. I'll talk more about that later. So, very much like a microphone stand, you got this upright, erect pole, and you got this big, heavy plate on the bottom. You know, I mentioned there's probably ton, you know, 20, 30 tons of wood up. There's probably that much underground. And you need that to hold that in. And then it's plugged into tons and tons and tons of soil. And that's what holds it up. Now, if I'm a little, um, if I'm a little organism, such as Ganoderma or um, the um, uh, Inonotus uh, buttress rot fungus, I like to inhabit this area right here. And, uh, you know, I'll find a wound and I'll start growing in there, then I'll start rotting this yummy wood on the inside of here out. And eventually, there won't be any structural integrity under this, limb, this tree, and the storm will come by and it'll fall over. Remember how I mentioned wood reacts? Uh, wood also reacts to all kinds of things. It reacts to, uh, so obviously, this is a weak area over here, so this tree is really piled on the wood over here to help support it from that side, right? Because it doesn't have roots that come out like this and support it. Uh, this is a tree over in the Pisgah Forest, but you can see how this tree has... Um, the tree wants to grow vertical as much as it can, and it will build up wood on the weak sides to try to hold itself up no matter what. And again, it's regulated by stresses on the wood. Um, this is an example of that uh, in the landscape. This is bad. This is called a bottle bud on a tree. If uh, it looks like a Coke bottle, but if you even if this weren't exposed and you didn't know there was a hollow in there, just by looking at the tree, if it goes down and it swells and it comes back, then it's got a hollow in there. The tree is adding wood around that hollow to try to fortify it. Okay, uh, and this is a def definitely a dangerous tree, a hazardous tree that should be taken down. Uh, tree growth is year-round. Uh, it's a year-round process. Tree growth, this is fascinating to me. So, have you ever noticed in February, um, you walk outside and you're like, oh, the buds are swelling. You'll notice on the red maples especially because they're early. Well, that started back in Dece the end of December at the equinox. So, those three days when the sun kind of sits in the same place around Christmas, uh, and then the days start getting longer, that's when the tree begins, slowly begins the process of pulling the reserves out of the root system back up into the canopy, okay? Uh, the reverse happens in the summer. So in June, the 24th, we have the summer, or around there, we have the summer uh, uh, solstice, and then the um, tree begins its fall, the downward hill slide towards fall. It starts slowing down, pushing this way, Eventually it stops and starts pulling down, and, and that's what pulls the, the nutrients out of the leaves and the leaf color comes from, right? Uh, tree grows, trees of course grow leaves in the, in the summer. Leaves are the food factories for the tree. We all know that. I'm not going to get into it. But it's super important uh, that they do have leaves and those leaves are healthy. Um, trees put on diameter in the trunk year-round. Um, there's a neat video at uh, the uh, Cradle of Forestry up in the uh, Pisgah Forest uh, that shows um, the diameter of a tree over time. So every day, if you take a micrometer and you measure it, the tree swells during the day as it's doing its business, and then at night it'll shrink a little bit because it's, it stops at night, right? It, it works in the day, then it stops at night. But every day it's adding a little bit, so you get this graph that does this over time as the tree gets larger in diameter. Um, so trees are very dynamic. I get this question all the time. You know what a lichen is? A lichen is a little crusty, gray um, organism that grows on rocks, right? And if you see it on a tree, it means that tree's not growing actively, right? It grows on rocks because rocks are stationary and they never move. A tree should be constantly moving, constantly getting bigger, constantly shedding bark, like we shed our skin cells. Bark sheds, sheds all the time. So things shouldn't be able to be, get attached to the tree, mosses and lichens and that sort of thing. And if you have a landscape tree and it's festooned with lichens and mosses, there's something wrong with it. It's not growing. Very common on dogwoods that are put out in the full sun because they're all stressed out and they're not growing well. And tree roots kind of grow throughout the year. Um, this, the, every year I write an article, please don't throw your leaves away. You know, don't burn your leaves. Your leaves are gold. They're, they're money. They're nutrients. In, in a nutshell, uh, trees are like a mining operation. 
They mine stuff from the ground, nutrients. They mix it with water and the carbohydrates made in the leaves. They make wood out of it and leaves. In the fall, those leaves fall to the ground. They decompose, returning them back to the soil in a balanced system, right? And you could think of it as a bank account, right? It stays in balance all the time. I wish, I wish we all could do that with our bank accounts, right? I wish we always had just enough coming in as we got going out. Uh, well, we screw that up if we take a negative, if we withdraw all the time. So the tree is withdrawing uh, the nutrients, and then we throw the nutrients away in leaves. We throw them away, we burn them, get rid of them. Well, what, does that ha what happens is the nutrient levels in the soil go down over time. So trees get worse and worse and worse and worse over time when you do this, right? So you try to keep your leaves, compost them and then return them back to the ground if you don't like leaves laying around everywhere, or sub substitute by adding organic matter and uh, fertilizer. It sure is a lot easier to leave the leaves though. But you need to replenish the bank account or the tree will run down and it'll run out of nutrients. Trees photosynthesize. They take light and they make food. We know that. Super interesting is that um, trees, um, so at night they're just sitting there. They're not doing anything. They're just kind of hanging. Well, they're actually using some of the stuff that they made during the day. But mostly they're just kind of sitting there. As the sun comes up and the day warms, the pores on the leaves, called stomates, will start to open. And as they open, water will start to evaporate out of the leaves. And over the huge canopy of a tree, that's uh, in a day, a tree can evaporate over 100 gallons of water. So uh, that is the tree's evaporating water, which creates a negative pull, right? So water gets pulled up the trunk, and then it gets pulled up the roots, and the root tips are out there pulling it in, sucking it into the end. So you got this cycle where um, water is getting sucked in the roots, evaporated out of the leaves, okay? That's where your nutrients, that's how nutrients get into the tree through that system. Well, at night it's supposed to stop. And the way it stops is it gets cooler and the stomates close. Well, my, my friend here has these um, arborvitae next to this rock wall facing south. Mm -hmm. So this rock during the day builds up this huge amount of heat and then emits it over the evening, so it never cools. So these trees are getting run down. Um, they're, re they're respiring late into the evening, which means they're using food, and eventually they'll use more food than they're making during the day. So whenever you hit, this is called a heat island effect. It's very common around buildings, municipal buildings, around banks. Um, if you, uh, you see the landscape around the bank, you, they'll, have all, they'll have like the same holly planted in the whole landscape, right? Uh, the ones out by in the middle of the yard will look much better than the ones next to the parking lot or next to the building where the heat uh, is radiating out. Roots, this is in Greenville in the park down there, that big park downtown. Yeah, you've probably seen that, right? It's also on the cover of a book about trees. Um, but uh, this is just a good example of how the tree root system is, it's structural of course, but it's also a, plumb, it's a plumbing system. Okay, um, and roots are interesting in that this little root tip right here is like a um, it's like a heat seeking missile. You know, how a heat seeking missile works. It finds heat in the sky and it goes to it. Well, those are nutrient water and soil texture seeking missiles. So that root just kind of randomly goes to the ground, feeling for soil that's got good texture. Right, because if you think about it, if you were like a mole or, and you swam through the ground for a living, that's what root, roots do, right? Well, if that root ground is hard as a rock, if it's been compacted because I drive my truck across it every day, then the root's not going to want to go through that soil. It's too hard. It's going to turn and go a different way, okay? Um, so those roots are root, and if they're, they're a sensor, and they look for water, nutrients, and soil texture, which is really important. Once they go down so deep, eventually you hit some kind of clay that's usually very acidic uh, and the roots can't grow there and they stop. So usually roots are in the very top uh, few inches of soil. That's why it's so important to protect those roots. Um, this is not nearly enough protection um, for this tree. You need to really protect way out to where the end of the roots might be um, to prevent uh, all kinds of damage to it, but also to give it uh, decomposing organic matter and that sort of thing. Um, everything we do in the landscape affects trees. So this is a good example. This is um, 
uh, a warm season turf grass that I took a picture of one time a long time ago in Georgia. But it demonstrates in the summertime, they know irrigation. It demonstrates where the tree roots are, right? The roots are here, or at least, at least the business end of the roots are here. The business end are way out here. This is where the water and nutrients are being taken up. So what is this doing? <laughs> it's, doing oh, it's, it's definitely doing nothing to protect the roots, and it's actually harming that trunk, having this, uh, this ring around this tree. Um, so this is where the root system, this is where the tree should be mulched to, right? Much further out, at least to the, we, where the, what we say is at least to the drip line, if not further out. Um, this is a great picture. It's old, but it's uh, uh, never found one that explains it better. When you have compaction or in, uh, unfavorable conditions on this side, the roots don't grow. That makes this tree weak on this side. The roots will try to compensate by growing in other directions, but these roots, the majority of them are only a foot underground. The vast majority of them are 12, 18 inches underground, unless you live somewhere where you have really great soil. Um, this, was, this was my home river, the Flint River in the middle of Georgia. We had a flood in 94 that scoured the banks uh, from a her, uh, tropical storm, and it left this one tree standing miraculously, and it just exposed the root system of the tree, and I thought, it just really shows you, look how built up this is. It's like muscles, right? I mean, it, this is what holds that tree up. And then you see the roots just randomly seeking nutrients and water going in every direction. All part of the system. This is also in my hometown. These trees were all built back in the old days when they built the, sub, the, uh, mill, the mill town uh, along with the mill. And these were 100-year-old water oaks that had been planted in these sidewalks. And you can see they had no roots, no structural roots. The interesting thing about a tree is that it can make feeder roots, the roots that actually, the little fine ones that take up water and nutrients, it can make those instantly almost. And in fact, every year the tree uh, puts out new ones and then in the spring, and say you get a drought in the summer, well those are all die and start to rot. And then if you get more rain later in the summer, well it'll put out a whole new flush of these little fine microscopic roots. So a tree like this that has slowly, the, the base of it has slowly rotted and disconnected it from all its roots, it put out millions of little feeder roots all in here, enough to keep that giant tree alive and take up water and nutrients. But it had absolutely no structural roots. It's pretty amazing if you think about it. If you see this on the top of a tree, it's not good. Uh, canopy, lo canopy loss is an indicator of a decline in the tree. Trees decline as they get older if they're not taken care of, if something happens to them. In this case, somebody d dug a trench right next to the tree, maybe 20 feet away from it. They dug a deep trench for a power line, an underground power. When they built the subdivision five years later, the lady who bought the house said, I think my tree's dying. So I went and looked at it and confirmed it for her, and there's not much you can do. There are some remediation things we'll talk about that you can do. So let's talk about some threats to trees. There are lots of them. Uh, many of them come in the form of invasive insects, right? Uh, all around Henderson County, there's dead ash trees everywhere. From the uh, hemlock, uh, uh, no, from the uh, emerald ash borer, uh, they, kill, they kill ash trees. You wouldn't think there's that many ash trees, but when you drive around Henderson County, because we have a lot of uh, floodplain, there's a lot of ash trees out there, and they're all dying. Um, Hemlock woolly adelgid, of course, wiped out our evenly aged stand of hemlocks that we had from Maine to Georgia. They're starting to come back from seed, but who knows if, they're, if it's going to make it. Uh, this one is one we don't have here, thankfully, but every tree in uh, Central Park every year gets every inch of it inspected for this one, the longhorn beetle, the Asian longhorn beetle. If you're from the coast, have a house on the coast, you know what the Red Bay is, you have the, uh, the big canopy of uh, live oaks, and then all of that green underneath is Red Bay, or it used to be, but now it's all gone. Especially in places like Savannah and uh, uh, Jekyll Island, St. Simons Island, the Georgia coast, South Carolina coast. From a little tiny beetle that's almost so small you can't see it, um, it got kept brought in on some packing material like pallets or something like that. Another one, that, <clears throat> another one that's come in is the Asian ambrosia beetle. Um, causes these uh, sawdust toothpicks when it drills in. It loves smooth barked trees, uh, Japanese maples, uh, red buds, it loves red buds, and lots of other things. Um, I teach a whole class on all of those things. 
So um, should you top a tree, or uh, some people call it hat racking? The answer is no. <laughs> Never top a tree. If a tree is so concerning to you that you're, it's, you're worried it's going to kill you in your sleep, just cut it down. <laughs> cut it down and plant a new one somewhere else. You know, and invest in the future. This is not a, this is an investment in a tragedy. You know, this is not an investment in the future. This is just putting off the cost of removing the tree. So you're going to pay more eventually for the maintenance of that until it's dead than you would have if you just cut it down in the first place, right? When I talk to people about trees, especially when I used to work as a professional arborist, I used to tell people, you know, does this tree keep you up at night? <laughs> if it does, maybe you should get rid of it. Plant another one. Invest in the future. You know, this tree's so close to your house, it's going to be dead anyway in 20 years. So why not just cut it down? You can sleep at night and plant a new one and invest in the next 100 years. But this is terrible to do to trees. The reason it's so bad is if you cut into a limb that's more than a, or is a third of the diameter of the trunk or bigger, it will never seal over. It has become part of the heartwood of the tree and there's no, the reaction wood can never, it won't live long enough for the reaction wood to cover that wound over. So you basically doom that tree to death. And every one of these cuts are going to get infested with wood rotting fungi and it's going to rot the inside of the tree out. Um, this is a, the biggest church in Henderson County. They had the most beautiful, lovely uh, red maples in their yard and, and their, their parsonage next door, which is now a school, I think. And they did this to it. So, you know, just a matter of time before it's dead. This probably would have killed it in the long run, but, um, you know, this is terrible for that tree for all kinds of reasons. So please don't do that. And tell your friends and neighbors not to do it too. Um, and if you tried to do this in the, if you did this in the Atlanta market where I used to work, you'd get run out of the business. People just don't top trees there. It's the, 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 the tree industry is much more mature in places uh, like the bigger municipalities. Out here, I mean, you can, I drove to Boone this winter to go skiing and I was appalled at the number of uh, topped trees up that highway going from Hendersonville. The electric company does a lot of that, right? The electric company, they just, what, what they do is the telephone lines, they draw a 30 foot, 30 foot circle around it and whatever's in that circle gets cut out. It doesn't matter. So they don't, they just cut what's it that's near that power line. Uh, they do a lot, yeah. They do a lot. They do a little better job there than they do here. Um, these are some older topped trees, and you can see uh, this up here. It's rotted. These limbs break out all the time and fall, and you're basically dooming the tree to death. Um, remember bottle butt? Remember I told you trees swell around hollows? Look how swollen the ends of these are. That's because these are hollow now. And as these grow larger and get bigger, they'll fall and break off the tree. So, the number one thing I see that kills trees and landscapes is improper planting. Improper planting. For some reason, uh, people in the mountains think that you can take a bald and burlap tree. And y'all know what that is, right? It's grown in the field. They dig it with a machine and they set it in a burlap lined wire basket and then package it all together real tight so they can ship it. Well, in Henderson County, I don't know about here, but they just drop it in the hole with the packaging on it and everything and then take off. Now, again, you couldn't get away with that in Atlanta, you'd get run out of the business, for sure. One of the reasons you can get away with it up in Hendersonville is we get 100 inches of rain a year sometimes, so uh, you pretty much could take that tree and set it on the concrete next to your house. <laughs> and if we're getting enough rain, it'll live for a few years, right? But eventually, as the tree tries to grow, all this catches up with it. Roots can't grow out of that burlap, and burlap does not rot underground. Y'all have all probably heard, oh, a burlap will just rot. Well, for one thing, they now treat it with chemicals to make it not rot. But secondly, they dig up fabrics from the Ming Dynasty and all that kind of stuff that are 3,000 years old underground all the time, right? So it's, if it's anaerobic, if there's no oxygen under the ground, it's not going to rot. It's just going to sit there. And I've seen roots grow through a burlap, and they'll be this big on one side, and then they'll be that big going through the burlap, and then they'll be that big on the other side. And you can just break them right at the where they penetrate. 
So remove as much of that packaging material as possible, at least a third, at the bare minimum a third, so that these roots can form in the top 12 inches of soil and go out. This down here is not so important. The roots are not going to grow down there anyway. It's too deep in the ground. Uh, build a berm around the tree uh, to hold water, but get rid of the berm within six months because the berm will erode and bury the root flare. You see the flare? So another thing is plant these a little high because they will always settle. Because a bald and burlap tree will weigh 250, 300 pounds, so it'll just slowly sink into the ground. Uh, all of that is true for a container plant as well. Make sure it's slightly higher than the soil. Build a berm, but take it away. And then don't over mulch. Don't mulch, just keep mulch off the trunk. Just don't touch the trunk with mulch. That's the best thing to do. I, this, this, this is my life right here, daily going around, looking at poorly planted trees that are dying in a, one at a time in some subdivisions, um, you know, entrance. Um, landscaper planted these things. Um, and you can see there, that's how deep underground they were. And I finally got down and there's all the nylon strapping and the stuff. So, you know, in a rainy area, this, this tree would not have lived six months in Georgia because we get dry, hot and dry. It would have just died. But in, 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 in a place where we get lots of rain, they can eke out a living for a number of years. These were there for over five before they started to finally start to die. Uh, this guy planted 100 Lelands in a row. And they were dropping like flies. I dug them up, and of course, um, they were still, there's burlap. It was still, had string tied around them. Leelands will tell on you really quickly because they grow so fast. Um, this is Ed Gilman's work, some of his research down in Florida. Uh, this is one he planted in the basket in burlap, and then came back later and dug it up. You can see how diminished these roots are, trying to get through that burlap. There's no big roots coming out. Um, uh, here's a wire basket 40 years later incorporated into the trunk. Um, that makes a lot of weak areas in the trunk. Um, there's a wire basket inside this wood. You can see the crack that it's created. There's roots growing out of burlap. Uh, they're being girdled right here, so they're very weak. You know, a tree can go from this, a root can go from that big around, go into a crack that you couldn't hardly fit your pocket knife into and then come back the other side out the other side of the rock and be that big around again. Trees are amazing and if they weren't there'd be a lot more of them dead in our in our yards. Uh, girdling roots these are roots that when you bury a tree too deep roots will wrap around the trunk. You see all these roots growing around the trunk and eventually they choke the trunk and kill it. If I walk up to a tree and it's looking puny the first thing I do is excavate the root collar and quite often I'll find a girdling root. Girdling roots can be fixed, you just cut them. If they're this big, they've gotten to, you can't really, and it's half grown into the trunk, you don't have to cut it all the way. If you just cut it halfway, maybe hatch it, take a hatchet, just lightly cut a notch in it. It's under so much pressure that from the trunk growing that eventually it'll break, right? So um, you're helping the tree break that root eventually. But you can see here the scar that left by this girdling root there in a very young tree. There's a big, nasty girdling root there. That's not fixable. It's too, too far gone. There's more girdling roots. Maples are very susceptible. Japanese maples are very susceptible to this. Anything that's really shallow rooted. Um, a lot of trees come from the swamp. Red maples um, and, and river birches and other things that come from wetlands. They are very shallow rooted because they need to be close to the surface to get oxygen when it floods. So um, they're very prone to this. You can see that, this strapping right there, all tied up in these roots. And that's its own root that's doing that? Yes, yeah. But it can also happen from other trees. So I've got a great picture of um, um, little leaf hollies, the little tiny leaf hollies, planted in a circle around a tree, and the tree's dying, and I dug down in there, and it looked like these, these roots were like wires wrapped around the trunk. Little fine roots, but there were so many of them, they girdled the tree and killed it. Um, this is a municipality that starts with an H. I won't mention who they are. Um, but I can't help myself. If I'm walking down the sidewalk and I see a tree buried too deep, you'll see me like a groundhog digging under that thing. So I go around following these guys and I dig stuff up and expose. You can see the dark, and the dark color there. This is interesting. So you know the bark on the, tr on, there's bark on the roots, right? Well, it's impervious to water and that sort of thing. 
But as it transitions to the aerial portion of the tree, that bark is not impervious to water. So if I bury this tree too deep, then you get water soaking through the bark and creating rot. So if I hadn't dug this out, there would have been a rot here within a number of years, right? And then the tree, five years from now, would start falling apart and dying. My master gardeners and I went to a local um, uh, interfaith assistance ministries. They built a new building. And um, some of their trees were that deep underground because the landscaper came in and planted his trees before they did the final grading. And so the final grading guys, they had all this dirt they needed to put, so they just sneakily piled it around everywhere. And so uh, I identified this as a problem. They spent 70 grand on these trees, and I said, they're all going to be dead in five years. So um, and rather than this, this um, um, organ nonprofit having to spend the money to hire somebody, Master Gardeners and I went out and dug them all up. And the best you can do is expose the root collar. I mean, you can't lift that tree out of the ground, right? But what you can do is you can expose the root collar so it will dry and not rot. Um, and you can see there how deep that one was planted. Look at this one. And uh, so what I did on this one, anywhere you can, you dig a trench so it will drain that, that, that little well that you make. And if you do that, then um, that's the best chance that tree has got to live. And those trees will probably live now. Um, they won't live as long as they could have. Uh, leaving stakes and all that kind of junk on the trees, that causes problems. It wounds the tree. You get diseases in there. This one was also had all the packaging on it. And that's a Leland, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which I don't like. This is the cliffs coming down the mountain off of, um, from Hendersonville. This is their golf house, the, what do you call that thing? Clubhouse. And these trees are all falling over now. Every time there's a storm, there's a new one that falls over. And if you look real close, you can see all that packaging around. And these, there, these have been there for a long time. Right? Now, these trees happen to be species that don't really... They'll grow anywhere, doesn't really matter. But structurally wise, you see this one leaning? Yeah. It's starting to topple. So these trees, look, see that strapping there? It's uh, girdling the trunk of this holly. Every tree, hundreds of them, all done wrong. And they're all starting to fall. And this is 30 years later, 25 years later after it was built. So that's why we got to finish. This is our wonderful Publix that just moved in. Hendersonville is the land of grocery stores. Um, we got one on every corner. And we have a new one in Publix. So I watched these trees get set out. And they sat there and 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 sat there. And, sat there. and then they finally planted them and half of them's dead now. The next year half of them are dead. So the point is, don't leave trees out. One of the reasons is, you know, trees grow perpendicular to the ground, right? The sun rays are always hitting them at an angle. No different than you walking around during the day. Like, you could walk around with your sleeves like this all day long and never get a sunburn, right? You do like me, you get in your kayak, and you got your kayak paddles out like this, and you'll get so sunburned on your arms, you don't even, can't even believe it. We're in the same clothes. The reason is, is now you're perpendicular to the sun rays. If you take a tree and dig it up out of the ground and lay it down, the same thing happens to the tree, gets a sunburn. This is at Sierra Nevada, and every one of their trees has got a sunburn. And it's been, that place has been there for how many years? Um, and these wounds are showing up, these old sun scalds in the, under the bark, especially thin bark trees like maples. It shows them really bad. And uh, it's on every tree all the way around the whole property. And that's all from those trees being in a parking lot like this for too long. So the point is, if you get a B&B &B tree, stand it up. Stand it up like this, put some blocks around it. And if you keep it wet, it'll sit there for, you can keep them for months. They used to do that all the time back during the building boom. Uh, they had all these re-wholesalers in Atlanta who would buy trees from farms, stick them in a gravel yard, put them under sprinklers, and hold on to them for months and sell them. Um, so improper planting, trees planted too deep, I see it all the time. Um, I just, I've got about thousands of pictures of trees planted too deep. This is a municipality that starts with an F that's in Henderson County. Um, these trees have subsequently been removed because they started dying. Um, and they planted the next ones a little better. Maybe, I was, maybe they heard I was making fun of them. Um, but you can see this tree hadn't been in the ground five, I mean, even two or three years. And look at all the roots already starting to girdle and or circle this, 
trunk because that thing was this much too deep underground. Uh, English ivy is my arch nemesis. I hate this plant. Um, this is back in Georgia, and that used to be a big mighty oak tree, but uh, slowly over time it's died, and the English ivy has out-competed it for nutrients, has grown out to the end of the limbs, made a bunch of weight and broke the limbs off, and just kind of pulls the tree down over time. Um, so English ivy is really bad. Um, Leland's. Leland's. <laughs> oh, Leland's. So uh, my good friend and former professor, Mike Durr, uh, was pretty much responsible for bringing this into the country and <laughs> promoting it, and like really promoting it as the next big thing, right? Because back in the 80s, we had these red tips. You know what red tips are? And they were, they were the ubiquitous screening plant in every subdivision, right? And then the fungus came around and wiped them all out. So we needed another plant. <coughs> Dr. Durr knew that Leland's grew like crazy, so he was telling everybody all over the place to plant them. And they did. And they planted them like they used to plant those shrubs, you know, tried to hedge them. And these, you can't, you can't hedge a Leland in the mountains. If you prune it, you can cut that thing into the most beautiful hedge you've ever seen. Um, but if you plant them like this, 10, 10 feet apart, and let them grow, they will eventually outgrow their space there won't be enough nutrients in the soil for all these tree roots and the trees will start falling apart. There's a bunch of diseases that kill them. Uh, you know what the ultimate height of a Leland cypress is? 150 feet. Yes. Um, and what, what typically happens is they'll start dying from the bottom up. The leaves will start, needles will start falling off. And, um, and then they're not, they're not fulfilling the uh, purpose that they were uh, intended for to begin with. Uh, which is a screen, right? So then, and there's nothing you can do to reverse this. Once it starts to happen, that's it. It's, um, so there's, that's what Leland's will do if you let them grow unchecked. Um, in, in, England, in England, where they've been around for a lot longer than they've been in the United States, people sue each other over Leland Cypress all the time. <laughs> because it'll be in their yard and it'll cover up their neighbor's house, like literally totally cover it. Um, and that'll all be here in 20 years from now. Uh, these giant, mighty, majestic trees in the Pacific Northwest, no, they're not redwoods, they're Leland's. Um, that, the friend of mine was an arb arborist out there, sent me these pictures, that Leland cypress was probably that big around. So that's the potential that they have. They'll never get that big here because they'll all be dead. <laughs> so they get all kinds of diseases that I'm not gonna go into. Um, but they cause all this damage, dead limbs, needles falling off. Um, I'm gonna skip through that. This is something that's so much more prevalent than it used to be. Uh, that tree died within a year of them doing that. The reason they die is because um, this becomes a compost pile. When mulch is more than a few inches deep, it becomes a compost pile, right? And their temperatures of 180 degrees inside there, cooking that compost, it cooks the bark and kills the tree. So now what they have in that yard, I swear, and I need to take a picture of it, is they sawed it off right at the top of that mound like that. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is beautiful. But we call that volcano mulching, and that is bad for trees. So if they're doing it, I know they're doing it at your church, at your place of work, at every municipality you ever go to, your neighborhood entrance, they're doing it. So if you want to save your trees, get out there, just do it, don't even tell them, just do it yourself. <laughs> and get a hoe and just pull that mulch back from the trunk and expose the root flare. I do it all the time. Uh, one day somebody's gonna say, what are you doing? <laughs> so the, these are um, um, cherry laurels that are planted too deep. Um, they, and, and they still have the packaging material on them. They got a disease. Um, but the point of this one is that this guy, landscaper, he's getting paid every year to bring mulch. Um, he brings mulch and every year they just keep piling it in this bu these bushes and the trees just get deeper and deeper and finally it started killing them. Oh, oh there's my good friend Henry. When I used to work at the, I used to run some research greenhouses at the forestry school at the University of Georgia and old Henry would come by and blow my dirt around <laughs> every week and I'd 
I'd see him at lunch, you know, we'd go have lunch up at the, the, sh the shop and I'd say, Henry, hey, can't you, why, why are you down there mowing my dirt, man? <laughs> He's like, that's just what I do, that's just what I do. So, but you can see, look at, look at what do, doing this for years has done. Doing this for years, driving around uh, a 700 pound mower with a 200 pound man on it, which is about a thousand pounds, driving it around and around and around these trees, uh, has compacted the soil, pushed it down, and it's also, you can see all of my soil blowing away in the wind, uh, and so the soil level just goes down around the trees. Look at it in the landscapes, you see it everywhere now. You didn't used to see this before the advent of these big heavy zero turn mowers, but they, they create these, um, these little islands where the trees are, and this is terrible for the trees. So eventually I got them, before I left, I got them to do an experiment. I said, look, let's just take all the limbs that fall this year, lay them all around here, and then let the leaves fall, and let's let it sit for the winter. And the next year it was beautiful. It looked like a park down through there. I don't know if we're saving the trees or not because it may be too far gone, but um, that's, we, we at least got them to do that. So if a, tree is if a tree is buried too deep, you can um, excavate the roots uh, out with what we call an air spade. Um, so if you have a municipality, a park, a church, and you want to spend some money doing this, and get it done by a professional, you can, you can hire somebody with a tree spade, an air, sp an air spade. So it basically blasts a, a um, it's an air cannon that blasts air out of this thing here and it will dig soil without cutting roots. It's amazing. So this guy right here is a demonstration. He, he plowed up this ground right here around this big magnolia that was buried too deep. He excavated the root collar so the girdling roots would be uh, fixed. And then he added a bunch of uh, nutrients and comp uh, compost and then turned the pressure down and stirred it in with the air. And then they mulched over the top. And that's called tree reinvigoration. And it works like crazy. Uh, you can take a tree that's half dead and do this to it in five years. You can take a before and after picture and it's amazing. It really works. And the reason is, is that you're exposing the root collar. Um, and this is called radial trenching. Um, remember I told you roots like soils that are easy to move through. So uh, if you come back and dig this, this trench up in five years, it'll be so full of roots you won't believe it. Whereas these spots right here, there will hardly be a root in it because the, tree, the roots will select this area because it's better. Especially if you add compost and organic matter and all that fertilizer to it. You can also do it with an auger. So that's a tree auger, uh, a soil auger on an 18 volt drill. These are um, products that are sold to arborists. They have mycorrhizae in that I'll talk about in a minute. Mycorrhizae are beneficial uh, fungi. And you just Basically, just like you aerate your lawn, you all know what that is. You poke holes in the lawn. You poke holes all around this tree to aerate the soil. Uh, air, yes, ma'am. Could you do that when you planted the tree? Could you go ahead and make those radii? Yeah, you sure could. Yeah, yeah. Anything or before you plant a tree, till the entire area up really well, so that you are loosening up the soil. That, I mean, that's why we plow, right, in agriculture. If, if we wouldn't spend all that money on the diesel fuel and tractors if it didn't make the soil better for the roots. So if you're planting a planting, like you're going to do a new bed, just till the whole thing up real nice and then dig your holes. And remember, don't add anything to the planting hole. No organic matter, no fertilizer. Just plant it back in the native soil so the roots will have a reason to go out and look for stuff and you'll get a bigger, better root system. So mycorrhizal fungi are incredible fungi that inhabit the root system of trees in forests. So it's, it's, it takes a while for this to get going. And this fungi, so you can see the brown root system is right here. All of the rest of that are, is a fungus. And these things can be very specific to sp tree species. Um, but what they do essentially is they're a bit of a parasite. So they're sucking some carbohydrates that this tree's making out. But in, in exchange, they're providing access to more water and nutrients. So they become like an extra root system for the tree. And this has been proven, shown to be super important um, to trees and forests. And there's a great documentary, and I stole the name of this title from it, uh, the, the, this talk, Secret Life of Trees. It's a great documentary. 
uh, the scientist in the Pacific Northwest has done all this work on trees and shown how they're connected underground. So she puts um, maybe some barium or some other radioactive thing she can test with a Geiger counter that it's such a low amount it doesn't hurt anything. She can put it in this tree over here and come back in a month and it'll be in all the trees because it's been shared among this network of mycorrhizal fungi that have connected all the roots. She's also shown that if she puts bugs on this tree, then uh, this tree will send a signal that goes through the system and this tree and all the ones around it will start making chemicals that the bugs don't like. So there's this whole interconnected web and forest. Now when I come in with my bulldozer and I push all the soil up, knock all the trees down, build my house and then plant my red maple in the front yard, I'm not going to have that anymore. So it's important to try to preserve this. Um, you know, now we're learning there's just as much important stuff underground as there is above ground. So um, you can inoculate trees by going into the forest. If you peel leaves back, you'll see mycorrhizal fungi just growing right under there. If you dig some up, take it, put it in your yard, spread it around your tree, that can uh, help inoculate the tree. And then what the arborists do with my box of stuff I showed you earlier, it's got the spores already in there and you add that to the soil and it starts to grow. And um, there are all kinds of nursery operations, tree op uh, every pine tree that's grown is dipped in mycorrhizae before it's grown. All the ones that the National Forest grows, um, they just matter, f um, of course, that's what they do to every single tree, it's all dipped in the mycorrhizae because they know what an uh, important thing it is for the tree. Um, uh, this lady calls that the wood wide weld. Um, her documentary, just look up Secret Life of Trees on YouTube. It's brilliant. It's really good. So, uh, 12 o'clock, is that when I was supposed to stop? Oh, I have lots more. <laughs> See, I, I have lots more. I could keep going. <laughs>